question. Um, one of these is GXB and the, the others are listed here. So the idea with this seminar is that it's based on recently published content uh, from one of the SEB's journals, so in this case, GXB. Um, but we will be doing um, seminars in the future from the other journals and more from GXB, so do look out for those um, coming up. So just a quick bit of background a bit about GXB. It's been um, publishing since 1950. We just had our 70th anniversary last year. Uh, John Lan is the editor-in-chief and he's based at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Plant Physiology in Potsdam in Germany. We have a very well-respected editorial board um, and it's, it's grown recently. It's quite large and um, more diverse now, so we should be able to accommodate papers from a, from a wide range of subjects. And we have an independent editorial office, so we are able to provide excellent customer service for our authors, reviewers and editors. So perks to um, publishing in JXB as well. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to mention that we do uh, themed issues, which so we do up to 10 of these every year. So these are themed special issues, often linked to meetings, but they don't have to be. So if you're interested in putting together a, a themed issue with us, please do get in touch. But um, I won't hold this up any longer, so I'll hand over to JXB editor Stephen Spohl, who's going to chair the session. Stephen. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, um Big welcome to everybody um, and a big thank you to the SEB and, and JXB for putting this webinar series together, which is really, really great. It is my great pleasure um, to welcome Diane Bassam from Iowa State University today for this, uh, this webinar series. Um, and Diane did a, a bachelor's degree in biochemistry um, at the University of Birmingham. Um, she then moved to the University of Warwick, also in the UK, uh, to do her PhD in, in biological sciences. Um, she then went to the US, um, where she joined as a postdoc, the Plant Research Laboratory at Michigan State University. And then in 2001, started her own group at Iowa State University, where she still is. Climbed through the ranks there, um, and in 2013 was appointed as the first Walker E. and Helen Park Loomis Professor of Plant Physiology. Now, her research has really focused on environmental plant cell signaling, um, and particularly the trafficking of macromolecules to the plant vacuole. Um, and there's a vacuolar degradation pathway that's of particular interest and very important for plant cell biology, which is known as autophagy. Um, and autophagy um, is required for resistance and tolerance responses um, to abiotic and biotic uh, stresses. And so, so Diane um, studies the regulation and the mechanisms um, of autophagy um, and all in context of our environmental signaling. Now, the way we'll run the seminar is that we'll, we'll take questions at the end using uh, the chat function um, in, in um, this system. And we would really like to promote an inclusive atmosphere and environment where everybody is able to ask questions. So to that end, we want to give priority first to students and postdocs to ask questions, while more established researchers and PIs hold back a couple of minutes before they ask their questions. And I'll remind you of this when we, when we get to the question answer session. So without further ado, uh, I'll hand over to Diane, um, who will talk to us about uh, how TOR mediates the autophagy response um, to an altered nucleotide homeostasis. So, Diane, welcome and look forward to your seminar. Thank you. Thank and you. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Um, thanks to you all for, for coming, and I very much appreciate the invitation to talk about uh, one of the papers that came out recently from our lab. Um, I put a slightly simpler title. So um, the, the title was the title of the paper. Um, but this kind of summarizes the project that I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm in the Department of Genetics Development and Cell Biology at Iowa State University. And we're very much focused on plant biology. Um, and my lab, uh, as Steve mentioned, is interested in how macromolecules uh, and other structures are degraded in plants, often as a response to stress. But today I'm actually going to talk to you about a project where we're not really looking at stress, but we're looking at the degradation of ribosomal RNA in plants. 
I wanted to start out by acknowledging people that have done this work. Um, they're really the major contributor to the paper that I'll talk about in a few minutes is Zach Kazibwe. And I think Zach's uh, on, the, uh, on the seminar right now. Um, there are some other people in my lab listed here. And also I wanted to point out some former lab members who have also contributed to the research that I'll talk about. And this project is a collaboration with Gustavo McIntosh, who's also at Iowa State and with his lab. So everything that I talk about is a collaboration with Gustavo. The big kind of overarching question of this project as a whole is how is ribosomal RNA degraded in eukaryotes? Ribosomes, of course, are really important. They take up a lot of the cell resources. So it's important that their number and their function is maintained. And this involves um, degrading ribosomes, and we're particularly interested in ribosomal RNA. We do know that aberrant ribosomal RNA is degraded in the cytoplasm. So these are well-studied RNA degradation pathways that happen when there's damaged um, ribosomal RNA or mutated, that kind of thing. We also know that in yeast, there's a selective autophagy pathway that's triggered during nitrogen starvation. And this is called ribophagy. And this is a pathway in which ribosomes in the cytoplasm are taken up into these vesicles called autophagosomes and are selectively delivered to the vacuole where they're degraded. And this is really a response to stress. It's a response to the nitrogen deficiency. What we don't know so much about is how ribosomal RNA is turned over under normal conditions. So this would be in the absence of stress, um, when ribosomes have reached the end of their useful life, potentially um, there's some damage, um, the ribosomes are disassembled, and we, we know very little about how this ribosomal RNA is then degraded so that it can be reused. And of course, there are massive amounts of ribosomal RNA in the cell, so it's really important to reclaim those resources for the cell to reuse. And we began this project from some, really some work that Gustavo, a collaborator, began looking at a ribonuclease. Now, Gustavo is very interested in, just in general, in RNA degradation. And he identified a ribonuclease in a Arabidopsis called RNS2. RNS2 is the only class 2 T2 ribonuclease in a Arabidopsis. So this is a family of ribonucleases that are conserved among eukaryotes. And the class 2 um, of class 2 sub, um, kind of subclass of these T2s are typically thought to be involved in cell homeostasis. And the surprising thing about RNS2 is that it localizes to the vacuole. And this was shown in a number of ways. I'm just showing you one um, experiment here where RNS2 was found to be localized in vacuolar fractions. So in this experiment, we purified protoplasts from Arabidopsis, and then from those protoplasts, purified vacuoles. And we can see this is our vacuolar marker, which is a phosphatase. Uh, highly enriched in vacuoles. And RNS2, this ribonuclease, also had activity that was enriched in the vacuole fraction. So the question then is, what is RNS2 doing inside the vacuole when RNA in general is in the cytoplasm? And so we came up with a hypothesis. Um, so here's the vacuole, RNS2 is inside the vacuole. And we predicted that ribosomes or other types of RNA as well would be transported into the vacuole. We don't know whether this would be as, as intact ribosomes or whether the ribosomes would be disassembled and then the components transported. RNS2 in the vacuole then would degrade this RNA down to um, probably nucleosides eventually. And there's a transporter that's in the vacuole membrane that can transport nucleotides, and this is called N1. And so we hypothesized that the breakdown products of RNS2 would be transported by N1 back into the cytoplasm where they can be reused by the cell. 
to test this hypothesis, we, we started to look at the, the ribosomal RNA, and we identified mutants in the RNS2 uh, ribonuclease that completely lack activity, as far as we can tell. Um, in these Arabidopsis mutants, we looked at the half-life of ribosomal RNA by pulse chase labeling. So here is a, a pulse chase, and then um, this is hours of chase, and then we measured the amount of the different ribosomal RNA subunits. And what we found was that um, in the RNS2 mutants, which is the solid line here, the um, ribosomal RNA was degraded more slowly than in wild type plants. We also have some uh, antisense RNS2 plants, and we see the same effect in those. And when we calculated the half-life from these experiments, we see that in the RNS2 mutant, the half-life is almost double that in wild-type plants, suggesting that RNS2 has a role in degradation of ribosomal RNA. Though, of course, it's not the only, um, not the only ribonuclease involved in this, as there are multiple pathways. Another phenotype that we noticed early on that really got my lab involved in this is that these RNS2 mutants have increased autophagy. And they have, not autophagy is a pathway that is normally active at pretty low levels under normal growth conditions and is highly activated during stress. And we see that RNS2 mutants um, have activated autophagy even under normal growth conditions. So for those of you that are less familiar with this pathway, when autophagy is activated, a double membrane begins to form around pieces of the cytoplasm. And this can be organelles such as mitochondria, it could be ribosomes, it could be individual proteins and other macromolecules. So a wide range of, of car cargo for this pathway. This membrane expands and eventually you get uh, the, the cargo is fully enclosed in this double membrane. And this vesicle after full formation is called an autophagosome. And you might want to remember this because this is how we quantify autophagy, or at least it's one of the ways that we quantify autophagy in our system, um, is the number of autophagosomes that are formed. The autophagosome then fuses with the vacuole, and of course in plants, the vacuole is acidic, it has a lot of lytic enzymes, so then all of the contents of the autophagosome can be degraded and the breakdown products can be recycled back to the cytoplasm so they can be used again by the cell. So we see that in our ribonuclease mutant, autophagy is activated even under normal growth conditions when normally it would have a very low activity. We can measure that because we have a marker for autophagosomes, a protein called ATG8, which is fused to GFP. And so we can see that when autophagy is activated, we can see these autophagosomes by fluorescence microscopy. And I'm showing you this down here. And um, this is wild type. Um, plants expressing our autophagosome marker. Um, you can start to see um, just a very few autophagosomes. So these, this is under normal growth conditions. Um, Con A is an inhibitor of degradation of autophagosomes in the vacuole. Um, so we add that to block degradation and allow accumulation of the autophagosomes so we can see them more easily. We also have this marker in an RNS2 mutant. And Notice that in the presence of Con A, we start to see all of these little punctate structures, uh, which are mostly inside the vacuole. These are the autophagosomes or the autophagic bodies, which are the autophagosomes after delivery to the vacuole. And to quantify autophagy, we can count the number of these punctate structures representing autophagosomes. And many of the graphs that I'll, that I'll show you in the talk are quantification of how many autophagosomes we see. So basically, the more autophagosomes we see, the more active the autophagy pathway is. So we went on to, to further test our hypothesis that RNS2 is degrading ribosomal RNA, and we introduced now some autophagy mutants. So autophagy genes typically are called ATG something, a number, um, and we have two different autophagy mutants here, ATG9 and ATG5, which are both components that are involved in the autophagy pathway. When we just looked at total RNA expressed as a, a fraction of the dry weight, 
What we saw um, was that RNS2 mutants have increased RNA compared with wild type. We saw that similarly, the autophagy mutants actually have increased RNA compared with wild type, suggesting that autophagy is playing some kind of role in this pathway. And I have to say that even now, we still don't really know what autophagy is doing, whether it's delivering that RNA to the vacuole or whether it has some other kind of function. Um, when we make double mutants between RNS2 and one of our autophagy mutants, we see a further increase in the accumulation of RNA, suggesting that these, these, uh, these genes or these proteins are working together in the RNA degradation pathway. And so we went on to look and see where this, where this ribosomal RNA is accumulating in the RNS2 mutants. And so we took our, our Arabidopsis plants of different genotypes, we extracted protoplasts, and from these we purified vacuoles. And from the vacuoles, we quantified ribosomal RNA, and then we compared with this with acid phosphatase to normalize um, for the number of vacuoles. This is a vacuole marker. And what we saw, so um, on the, the y-axis here is just the amount of RNA um, in wild type plants, um, we didn't see very much RNA inside the vacuoles. Um, we think that it's probably being degraded as soon as it's transported there. In the RNS2 mutant, we see an increase uh, level of RNA inside the vacuoles. So we think that the RNA is being transported into the vacuoles and then it cannot be degraded because we're missing the ribonuclease. So it just accumulates inside the vacuoles. In the autophagy mutants, we see very little RNA in the vacuoles. And then interestingly, we see in one of the autophagy RNS2 double mutants, looks like RNS2. So uh, the RNA is still getting into the vacuole and it's no longer being degraded because of the RNS2 mutant. And in the other one, we see that the accumulation of RNA is blocked. So this suggests one, one possibility is that this ATG5 gene is required for transport of the ribosomal RNA into the vacuole, but we still need to confirm that. But really the take home from this, I think, is that if you block RNS2 in the RNS2 mutant, the ribosomal RNA can no longer be degraded in the vacuole and accumulates instead. And so this brings me back to our model. Um, some parts of it we have now confirmed. So ribosomes or ribosomal RNA is somehow transported into the vacuole and autophagy may be involved in this, but we still need to clarify. RNS2 degrades this RNA, produces nucleosides, which are then transported back to the cytoplasm so that they can be used um, again by the cell. So we were very interested in this idea that autophagy is activated in the RNS2 mutant. And we predicted that it's, um, it's a mechanism to try and compensate for loss of the RNA degradation in the vacuole. And so to, to begin to look at this, we ask what effect does the loss of RNS2 have on metabolism um, in these um, RNS2 mutant plants? Uh, so the first thing we did was a transcriptome analysis. Now, autophagy is typically activated by nutrient deficiency as a stress. It's one, one of the stresses which strongly activates the autophagy pathway. So we initially hypothesized that maybe um, the RNS2 mutants were acting as nutrient or energy deficient plants and that that was what was triggering autophagy. Our transcriptome analysis actually suggested the opposite. When we compared the genes um, with, that were differentially expressed in an RNS2 mutant compared with wild type, just under normal growth conditions, they looked very similar to the pattern of expression when glucose was added, and actually the inverse of carbon starvation, and these are also, these other two were also kind of energy deficient. And so this transcriptome analysis actually suggested that our RNS2 mutants may be, at least in terms of gene expression, in a high energy state, not uh, an energy deficient state. When we looked at the, the nature of these genes um, and their potential functions um, that were differentially expressed. What we found uh, by a kind of a network analysis was that these were enriched in genes encoding pentose phosphate pathway enzymes. Um, 
suggesting that maybe the pentose phosphate pathway was involved in the changes in this mutant. And so we went on to do um, some targeted metabolome analysis. We did uh, looked at pentose phosphate pathway metabolites in the mutant compared with wild type. And what we found was that at least some of these so S7P and ribulose 5-phosphate, these are specific to the pentose phosphate pathway. And we saw that these had significant changes in the RNS2 mutant. So when we put together the, um, the gene expression analysis and the metabolomics that we did, um, what we found was that indeed there seemed to be changes in the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, and the conclusion that we came to is that most likely um, this led to an increase in substrates that were, would then be channeled to de novo nucleoside synthesis. And so this fits our hypothesis that the, um, the problem with the RNS2 mutants is that nucleosides cannot be recycled. And so instead, nucleoside synthesis pathways are activated. So I'm now going to move on. That, that's really all background for the paper that um, I'm talking about today. And most of the work I'm going to present now uh, was done by a PhD student, Zach Kazibwe. Here's Zach, he's uh, presenting his work at the Kornbelt RNA meeting in this picture. And Zach is the first author on this paper that we, we published recently in, in Journal of Experimental Botany. Um, looking at um, the autophagy response in this RNS2 mutant. And the, the really underlying question that Zach wanted to ask is, why do these RNS2 mutants have increased autophagy? Um, so we look back at this model that we have where RNS2 degrades ribosomal RNA to produce nucleosides that are recycled to the cytoplasm. In our RNS2 mutant, um, the, the RNS2 activity, as far as we know, is completely gone. And so we think that this would lead to a decrease in the breakdown products, the nucleosides, in the vacuole. And then in turn, this may lead to a decrease in nucleosides or nucleotides in the cytoplasm. And so our hypothesis was that reduced cytosolic nucleotide concentrations may activate autophagy, um, potentially to try and compensate for this loss of breakdown of RNA in the vacuole. So Zach went on to test this hypothesis. And he hypothesized that if this autophagy in the RNS2 mutant is due to reduced nucleotide or nucleoside concentrations in the cytoplasm, then adding um, nucleosides to the RNS2 seedlings potentially will suppress the autophagy that he sees. Um, and so he started out with inosine. And the reason he used inosine is this, this is a purine that can be converted to a lot of the other purines very easily in the cell. And so he compared um, the RNS2 mutant in blue with wild type in orange. And in the absence of inosine, of course, the RNS2, as we know, has a high level of autophagy and wild type has very little. With increasing concentrations of inosine just added in the medium, we find that this autophagy is suppressed in the RNS2 mutant and by 10 micromolar, it's basically down back to wild type concentrations, indicating that the addition of purines suppresses um, autophagy the autophagy that we see in these mutants. Um, he tried a, a range of different uh, nucleosides, so inosine and hypoxanthine of purines, and they both will suppress the autophagy that he sees in the mutant. When he adds pyrimidines, he sees no effect. So this suggests that purines, but not pyrimidines, are important in, in this autophagy regulation. There's a different way to look at that he used wild type plants and he depleted nucleotide concentrations by adding inhibitors. So this is a, a simplified version of uh, purine synthesis. And so he has the, the de novo purine synthesis pathway at the top where the pentose phosphate pathway feeds in 
um, substrates for, for the, the de novo synthesis. And then the salvage pathway um, underneath, which is where purines are retained after breakdown of RNA. And inhibitors were added at different points of this pathway to look at their effect on autophagy. And this was just in, in wild type plants. And what he saw was that um, when he measured autophagy in the control, of course, there, there's no activation. But each of these inhibitors of purine synthesis or purine salvage caused an activation of autophagy. And this activation could be suppressed by then adding inosine back. He also tried pyrimidine inhibitors, uh, synthesis inhibitors, but again, could not see any effect. So it seems to be specific to purines. And so the next question he asked was, if autophagy is activated because of depletion of purines, which pathway triggers this activation of autophagy? So he was interested in the signaling that led to activation. We know that autophagy in Arabidopsis is regulated by a series of protein kinases in phosphorylation cascades. And two of the most important kinases that uh, regulate autophagy are TOR kinase, so this is target of rapamycin, and TOR is a negative regulator of autophagy and a positive regulator of growth. So TOR really regulates this balance between growth of the plant and repression or activation of autophagy. The second kinase is called SNOC1, and SNOC1 is a positive regulator of autophagy because it suppresses TOR activity, which then allows autophagy to be activated. So we look to see whether these kinases are involved in the activation of autophagy in the RNS2 mutants. Um, so here I'm showing you uh, an experiment. I just, just wanted to point out here, auxin is an activator of TOR. So if you add auxin, it will activate TOR, which also activates growth and represses autophagy. So we can use auxin as a tool to control the level of TOR activity. And so in, in wild type plants expressing our, our autophagy marker, uh, auxin really has, has no effect because TOR is already active. In the RNS2 mutant, we see the constitutive autophagy under control conditions, and this is repressed by the addition of auxin. So this suggests that this autophagy in RNS2 is dependent on the repression of the TOR kinase activity. We did a similar experiment um, looking at the SNOC1, the upstream kinase, um, and inhibiting it by adding T6P. We actually found there was no effect. So currently we don't have any evidence that SNOC1 is involved in this pathway. And so this leads us to uh, a model where nucleotide deficiency represses TOR activity, which in turn represses autophagy. And so if, uh, if, nucleotide, if, if nucleotides are deficient, we'll get activation of autophagy because TOR is repressed. Um, we looked at this further to see the effect of inosine um, in relation to TOR. And for this, we used a mutant called Raptor1b and Raptor1b has decreased TOR activity. This is one of the components of the TOR complex. So Raptor mutant under control conditions has constitutive autophagy, you know, similar to the RNS2 mutant because TOR is inhibited. What we found was that if we add inosine to the Raptor1b mutant, it actually had no effect. It did not repress the autophagy that we saw, which if you remember is opposite to the RNS2 mutant. So we think that inosine and nucleotides must be upstream of TOR. And we did this, a similar experiment in, in a different way, where we looked at the RNS2 mutant, which of course has constitutive autophagy, which is suppressed by inosine. If we do that experiment in the presence of a TOR inhibitor called AZD, inosine is no longer able to repress this autophagy. Again, suggesting that the nucleotides are acting upstream of TOR in this pathway. If that's the case, we would um, expect the, the nucleotide levels to have an effect on TOR kinase activity. 
and we can measure TOR activity using one of its well-known substrates, S6K. And we have antibodies against S6K in general, and these antibodies in a Western, we can see two bands. The upper band is the phosphorylated version, and the lower band is the non-phosphorylated. And we also have antibodies that are specific to the phosphorylated version of S6K. And uh, in wild-type plants, you can see these two bands clearly because TOR is active. When we add the TOR inhibitor, we see reduction in the upper band, indicating decreased TOR activity. In the RNS2 mutant, we have almost completely lost detectable TOR activity, suggesting that in RNS2, TOR activity is reduced. Um, we then looked at the effect of inosine um, using these same antibodies. It may be clear if you look at the, the phospho antibodies. In wild-type plants, inosine has no effect on, on TOR activity. In the RNS2 mutant, we have much lower TOR activity. And this comes back up to wild-type levels when we add inosine, indicating that, that inosine is now activating TOR. So when we put all of these results together, we can come up with a model for how autophagy is activated in this RNS2 mutant. So we think um, that under normal conditions, ribosomes or ribosomal RNA is transported into the vacuole. The ribosomal RNA is degraded by this RNS2 ribonuclease to produce nucleosides, which are transported by N1 into the cytoplasm. These nucleotides, of course, can then be used in primary metabolism. This allows activation of TOR kinase, which prevents autophagy activation. So in our RNS2 mutant, we've got reduced nucleotides, which would reduce TOR activity, and autophagy would be activated. Um, so I think the, the main piece that we now need to address in this model is what is the function of autophagy? Um, in the RNS2 mutant, now we know why it's activated or how it's activated. So I'll just finish by reminding you that uh, a lot of this work was done, done by Zach, PhD student in the lab, and also that uh, we're collaborating with Gustavo McIntosh and his lab in, to really try and understand these details of ribosomal RNA metabolism in the cell. And at that, I will leave it, and I'll be happy to take any questions from you. Thank you, Diane. Just waiting for my video to come on. There we go. Um, thank you for a lovely talk there. We'll now open it up for questions. Um, so for questions, please use the chat function. Uh, you will find that in the upper left corner of your screen. There's a box there that says uh, chat. Um, and as I said at the beginning of the seminar, uh, we first welcome questions from uh, students and postdocs before we uh, we move on to anybody else. Um, so please type your, your questions in the in the chat box. While we wait for the first question to come through, Diane, um, just thank you again for a lovely seminar. Um, and I'll, I'll launch maybe the first question. So I find it very interesting that the RNS2 mutant has increased autophagy. Um, but what I'm wondering is whether this is autophagy that's specific to our RNAs or in general, um, autophagy is up. So essentially, what is the card um, in, in, in those mutants? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. I we don't really know, but what we have seen is that we can we can label with a fluorescent dye to label RNA, which you know mostly we're seeing our RNA because it's the only one that's abundant enough to detect by that method, and we could see it in autophagosomes, which was to me a little bit unexpected. <laughs> um, so we could detect RNA co-localized with the autophagosome marker, and then delivered to the vacuole in in the RNS2 mutants. But saying that. I don't really think it's going to be specific for RNA. I think probably what we're seeing is bulk activation of autophagy as this mechanism, um, as a mechanism to deliver RNA to the vacuole to compensate. But probably there's a lot of other things being taken there as well. 
And we don't really know whether whether our RNA is, is delivered as, as just RNA or whether it's actually delivered as part of a whole ribosome as well. I see. Okay, thank you. Um, first questions are coming through here. First question from Mustafa Sonmas. Uh, he says it's a great talk and thank you for it. Um, why do you think purines, not pyrimidines, are important in this mechanism? Yeah, we have. We really have no idea. Um, what I can say is that this is has also now is also been seen in mammalian cells that in that tor activity in general. Um, is regulated by purine concentrations. Um, maybe pyrimidines have a role, but we're not detecting it in the experiments that we do. Um, but we really don't know. We don't know why purines would, would be more important for, for the signaling pathway. But it does seem to be consistent between species. Okay, the next question is from Tanya Matur. Nice to see you again here, Tanya. Um, she says, thank you, very interesting talk. I was wondering if perhaps the persistence of rRNA implied a persistence of ribosomes itself, leading to increased protein synthesis and perhaps even the production of faulty proteins from H ribosomes. Perhaps increased aggregation of these proteins is dealt with through autophagy. And then her second question is, do you observe any increase in protein aggregation or misfolding in these RNS2 mutants? Okay, yeah, that's an interesting, interesting idea. We haven't seen any increase in, in protein aggregation, at least that we detect. I can't say we've, we've looked at it in a lot of detail, but we haven't seen that. We are interested in the idea that the um, kind of the first part of the question, that we may be seeing um, more ribosomes accumulating because we have no evidence that this is or very little evidence really we just we don't know that this is just RNA that's accumulating and what we're trying to do now is to figure out um, what is it about these aged ribosomes or, or um, you know ribosomes at the end of the useful life what is it that's detected and triggering this degradation and I think there's a good chance that we are that we do see an increase in these ribosomes maybe not that are functional we don't know that they're producing proteins but that they maybe or have uh, we may have accumulation of, of damaged ribosomes so one of the things that we're trying to understand now is what is being recognized in these in these old ribosomes is is it damage to the ribosomal rna or actually is it damage or um you know, misfolding or something like this of, of proteins that are that are in there. And there's a, I think there's a reasonable chance that the entire ribosome, all ribosomal subunits are being delivered to the vacuole for degradation and not just the ribosomal RNA. Yeah, that was a very good question there. Um, open it up for me to uh, ask questions. Um, so just going, um, like in the chat box. In the meantime, I'll ask you another question, uh, Diane. Um, I was wondering what you think about RNA binding proteins in general. So you're, you're looking very much specifically to at, at ribosomal RNA here, but what about RNAs and their normal RNA binding proteins, even for, for mRNAs, et cetera? Um, do they also end up through this pathway? Yeah, uh, there is some evidence that they do. and. Um, there has been a study where um, vacu for purification of vacuoles and looking at the RNA contents. And yes, I, the reason we're, I mean, we're interested in ribosomal RNA degradation, but really the reason we're looking that, at that in relation to RNS2 is because it's, it's abundant and it's e easy to detect. Because the amount of RNA accumulating inside vacuoles is, is fairly small, even, you know, even when these pathways are active, it's, it's not a huge amount. And so we can detect the ribosomal RNA very easily, but I do think that other types of RNA are probably being degraded by this pathway too. Um, you know, mRNA, tRNA, other types of cytoplasmic RNA. Yeah, I don't necessarily think it's specific to ribosomal. Right, and it, but do you think do you think that's an RNS two dependent degradation pathway as well then, or do you think there are think other dedicated ribonucleases? Um, so I think the vacuolar pathway is dependent on RNS two. Now, obviously, for all types of RNA, there are 
there are major degradation pathways in, in the cytosol and the cytoplasm um, that are dealing with all kinds of, you know, damaged or um, uh, mutated RNAs, things like this. And those would not involve RNS2. But I think there is a pathway that takes RNA into the vacuole. And as far as we can tell, RNS2 is the only ribonuclease that's in the vacuole. So I think anything that's degraded by the vacuolar pathway is going to involve RNS2. Right. Okay. I see. That's good. Um, I see there's a few questions being typed at the moment, um, but they haven't quite come through yet. Can I ask you in the meantime about the high energy state of the RNS2? Yeah. Um, um, I find that quite interesting and I, I didn't quite understand how you relate it to um, to the to the rest of the phenotype, really. Why why is it in this high energy state, and, and yeah, we, how do you define um, it? Yeah, this is really just based on gene expression data. So we we did the we were, we were really testing the hypothesis that maybe they were in a a low energy state. We we thought that maybe the because autophagy is normally triggered by nutrient deficiency, including fixed carbon deficiency, which probably leads to low energy. And so we thought that initially that maybe that was the case and that this was triggering autophagy. Um, but we got the exact opposite result with the, R, um, the RNA expression analysis. Uh, so, um, so, you know, why they're in a high energy state? Um, yeah, we don't, we don't know. It just, the, the gene expression patterns indicate that. Um, it's... Uh, and we certainly, now, these mutants, weirdly enough, the RNS2 mutants are bigger than wild type, very, very slightly bigger than wild type. So these are not sickly mutants um, under normal conditions, despite the constitutive autophagy and these other <laughs> defects that, that you might imagine. Um, these, these are bigger. And uh, the other set of genes that was found in that um, in the expression analysis, uh, were some were related to cell wall and cell wall loosening, and that might that might relate to the the size that we see. Um, but it's possible that you've got this constitutive autophagy; it's breaking down a lot of stuff, and that's been used to produce energy. And so um, that's kind of the function of autophagy. So maybe if you trigger autophagy um, constitutively, you'll start to see this high energy um, that because there's a lot of you know produces a lot of TCA cycle substrates and things like this. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting that you mentioned the mutant that is that it's actually quite healthy. I, I wouldn't have expected that. That is very Yeah, cool. yeah. It's it's they're they're just very it's very healthy and they're just very slightly bigger. I mean you kinda have to do measurements. Like if you just look at them it's not not real obvious, but but yeah, they grow very well. Yeah. Um in the meantime we've had a question from Jose Luis Crespo. Um, he says, nice talk, Diane. Uh, do you have any guess about the mechanism connecting one and nucleus, mm -hmm. perhaps directly? Hi, Jose Luis. Um, uh, well, it would be, it would be just guesses. Um, this is something we're interested in, of, of course. Um, I, it seems to me unlikely that it would be direct, that, that TOR would actually be binding nucleotides or something. And, um, and uh, it would that it would directly um, regulate TOR activity. My best guess is that it's one of the upstream regulators of TOR that's somehow sensing nucleotide concentrations. Um, as you know, we uh, we don't know very much about the upstream regulators of TOR in, in Arabidopsis, um, and so um, yeah. It, my best, my guess is that one of those would be would be binding and sensing nucleotides, but we don't know which one or if it's even one of the known regulators. Um, in say in, in mammalian cells, where they've also shown that TOR is regulated by nucleotide concentrations in, in in mammalian cells, or although this is not linked to RNA degradation necessarily, um, they they also don't really know. They think that. Um, some of these GTPases that are upstream of TOR um, may be the components that are that are doing this, uh, but those are not present in Arabidopsis, so it doesn't really give as much clue as to what's going on.
thank you. Okay, thank you, Diane. I think if I don't see any further questions coming in, um, then I'd like to thank you very much for a really lovely seminar and some fantastic work. Um, so great to have you here. Um, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, you'll see a message here from Rebecca in um, uh, the chat asking you if you could uh, take a moment to please fill out the attendance survey. Really will only just take a minute, so please do leave your feedback with us. Um, thank you all for attending um, and hope to see you soon at the, the next message at the next webinar.